Welcome to today's special edition of Go Beyond with Pastor Michael Eurisha. Michael is an international speaker, songwriter, and the senior pastor of the Judah Ministries International Worship Center, located in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. If you are ever in the greater Pittsburgh area, be sure to come and visit us. For more information about our ministry, please feel free to visit our website at www.judahministries.net. Here's Pastor Michael. So this morning, I want to uh, present my periodic update as to where are we prophetically in the light of end times or in the light of eschatology. In other words, how close are we to the tribulation period? How close are we to the rapture? How close are we to the revealing of the Antichrist? And obviously, how close are we to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Now, concerning the end times, the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament is full of signs and predicted events that precede Jesus' second coming. Even Jesus himself gave us many signs to look for, and I know you hear me say this often, Jesus said, watch and pray. Are y'all with me? Watch and pray. He said there will be wars, rumors of wars. He said there'll be earthquakes and pestilence. Uh, in other words, uh, th that word in the Greek actually means disease. Did somebody get a revelation right there? Great deception, Jesus said, will be in the last days. And how many of you know the deception is great today? You don't know what to believe anymore. It's just so chaotic in the airwaves. You know, the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. You've got to be careful what you're watching through that little electronic device that you carry around. Are, are you all with me? Be selective. Don't watch everything. I don't say, even care if it says Christian on it. Now, come on, somebody help me. But Jesus says there'll be great deception uh, just before his coming. And he also said, you will be hated because of me. Yeah. Listen, saints of God, there's an unparalleled level of vitriolic hatred toward the Jews and Christians right now. And Christians, listen, are by far the most persecuted people in the world. And it's rising, not Diminishing. Look at Afghanistan, in Nigeria, Pakistan, Iran. Here's my question with all this turmoil going on, all this hatred going on. Here's my question. Where's the political outcry for the Christian persecution? Where's the united nothing? I mean the United Nations. Where's the outcry? No, but if you should say he, if it was a she, the world goes crazy. Are you hearing me, somebody? Because somebody's feelings got hurt. But where's the outcry of the persecution to the Christians around the world? It's crickets. It's crickets. Jesus also said that there would be signs in the heavens, which is the first topic that I want us to look at today, especially with the total solar eclipse that is passing over the USA tomorrow. Let me put a date stamp on this time stamp. It's tomorrow is April 8, 2024. So if you're watching this later, you'll know where we are in this message. So this has caused a lot of pathetic words. I mean, prophetic words. A lot of opinions, even in the church. Everybody and their brother now have a YouTube video with an analysis of paralysis. Come on, do I got a witness in the house? Secondly, we're going to talk about the current state of Israel. So we have a lot of material to get through today. So pray that pastor speaks quick so we can get to some chicken. Amen. 
But first, we want to talk about the signs in the heavens and the impeding solar eclipse. So let me throw in on this event and hopefully, hopefully add some biblical clarity. Because how many of you know there's not a lot of biblical clarity out there? Now, if you're not aware of the total solar eclipse that is happening tomorrow, you must be living under a rock. Anybody living under a rock in here? All right, so we all know what's going on tomorrow. Amen? Amen. But let me bring you up to speed just a little bit. I have a, but this is going to be a, a show and tell this morning. I have a lot of slides to show you, a couple little video clips, but hopefully to give you some information that'll cause some transformation in your life. Amen? So the first slide, this is the total solar eclipse that will start in Texas. It will pass over the USA and it will exit out of the state of Maine. So just seven years ago in 2017, we had another total solar eclipse that began in Oregon and it traversed over the nation and it exited out of the state of South Carolina. And as you can see, these two eclipses make an X over the USA, which has thrown the pathetic, I mean the prophetic world in an uproar. All right, now, does this have prophetic implications? Is this a sign of something? Well, now before we discount this as there are always eclipse, uh, eclipses, which is true, we also have to be very careful, saints of God, not to read too much into every solar eclipse or stellar phenomena. Stellar phenomena. However, God does use the heavens to speak to his people. Can somebody say amen? amen? Because it shows it to you in the word. So let me out, lay out a scriptural foundation for God speaking from the heavens. Let's take a look at his word. It's right in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And, somebody say, and to let them serve as, somebody say, signs. So let me pause right here in this verse. God said, let them serve as signs. The word in the original Hebrew is alf, means to give direction. In other words, the large billboard in our stellar system. If you're driving down the highway and you see a big billboard and it says ABC restaurant, exit five miles. Basically, that is giving you information of what is ahead and how long it's going to take you to get there. Did you just follow me? So God gives us signs in the heavens. How, uh, what, and how close are we to our destination? Now, listen, God did not put the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky for some astrologers to start 1-800-CALL-THE-PSYCHIC. Now, how many of you have been tied up in that before? No, I'm not trying to put you on blast. I need a husband. 1-800. I know, I know Christians don't do that sort of thing. Nah. My God, huh? But listen, God placed the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky for direction and a calendar for his people. They are a source of communication, not the only source, but a source. The verse goes on to say, and let them serve as signs, here it is, now watch, to mark seasons, days, and years. So right in the book of Genesis, the Bible says, God says these sun, moon, and stars are to serve as a purpose. They are to serve as signs. The sun, the moon, and the stars are keeping God's date book. They are keeping God's calendar. They are his Apple Watch or his Google Calendar, if you will. Everything is perfectly synchronized in the heavens. Are you with me? Now, we, we studied this out, that we've seen that every planet, every galaxy, every star is in perfect rotation. We studied this out in our teleological argument when we went through our study uh, several months ago. Now, they are heavenly signs to mark. Let me break these three words down for you. Days is, in the Hebrew, it's yom. It simply means a 24-hour period from sunset to sunset is one day. It's a 24-hour period. The word is known as yom in the Hebrew. Many of you, you are familiar with yom kippur, day of atonement. Are you with me? 
So yom simply means it's to point out days. Sunset to sunset. The second word is months, which is shane. Simply means a means a division of time, meaning from like new moon to new moon, or from one year to another year. It's a division time. But the key word here is seasons, which in the Hebrew is moed. Now translated uh, to English as season, but not in the traditional sense as we know the word season here in the United States, which is winter, spring, summer, fall. Moed in the Hebrew means an appointed time or a convocation or a meeting time. All of the Lord's feast, when God would have a special meeting with the Israelites, it was regulated and scheduled by the heavens. It was a moed. You remember the story in Genesis 18 when Sarah at 90 years young conceived Isaac. It was the son of promise. If you read your Bible, it says in that season, in that moed, in that appointed time, the son of promise was born. We see the same principle in Galatians 4 and 4. When Jesus was born in the fullness of time, it has the same idea, the same concept, an appointed time. So God uses the heavens to keep a schedule. If you're tracking with me, somebody say amen. Psalm 19, verse 1, states this. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, here it is, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Uh, verse 4, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. Listen, our God controls the heavens. Somebody go ahead and give him a praise right there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let me give you a few, a few examples. Many of you are familiar with the story of Joshua in Joshua 10. He said, listen, Lord, uh, I need a sign from you. Uh, stop the sun. And how many of you know God stopped the sun for about the period of a day? Why? Because our God controls the sun. So all these global warmest and whatever they call it now, global elitist, they control nothing. Our God controls the weather. I don't care how many cars you try to el eliminate. All right, let me go on. So God saw the sun. He hit the pause button and let it stop for about the period of 24 hours, which allowed us actually to land on the moon. That's another message for another time. We see the Magi followed the star of Bethlehem to Bethlehem when Jesus, after he was born, it led them to Jesus, the Savior. We saw the crucifixion. The Bible says that the land went dark from about noon to about 3 p.m. There's a Roman historian named uh, Phlegon. I, I have this up there. He, he wrote this um, uh, years ago. It's a Roman, it's a secular historian that wrote this. He said in the fourth year of uh, the second hundred, I'm sorry, the yeah, second hundred and second Olympiad, which was 32 AD, there was an extraordinary eclipse of the sun at the sixth hour and the t day turned in, uh, into dark night so that the stars in heaven were seen. And there was an earthquake. Now, how many of you know we read that in our Bible on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? How many of you know God's word is firm and amen? It's true. Every jot and tittle, even secular historians report it. Lastly, to make this point, uh, is Peter in, quoted in Joel in Acts chapter 2. He said that in the last days, the sun would not give its light. The moon would be as blood. Jesus spoke about the Olivet, uh, at the Olivet Discourse. Uh, the Apostle John wrote about it throughout the book of Revelation. So signs in the heavens are biblical. Somebody say amen. There's absolutely no doubt. But as with everything, here's the caveat. Be careful of hyper spirituality. It will lead you astray. Some folk read way too much into certain events and heavenly phenomena and begin date setting. If you ever hear somebody date setting, turn them off. Don't ever go back and listen to them again. Is that fair enough? Come on, y'all with me here, Judah? Turn them off. 
They're a false prophet. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Here, here, here it is. They exegete, eisegete, rather than they exegete the Word of God. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. They try to impose things on the Word of God rather than let the Word of God speak to them. Let me give you four modern examples. I'm going to go through these quickly here. This is the four blood moons. It's called a tetrad. If you could put my first one up there, Caleb. This is NASA's information. This is a total lunar eclipse. The first one happened. Uh, Mark Biltz, a pastor, is the one who discovered this. But this is in 1492. You can see the first one. It's a, a tetrad is what NASA defines as four consecutive full lunar eclipses. But not only are they lunar eclipse, look at the days that they fall on. They fall on Passover. They fall on tabernacles. They fall on Passover again. They fall on tabernacles again. So four consecutive lunar eclipses fall directly on the Lord's feast. So what's the significance of 1492 to 1493? Because remember, all prophecy is Israel-centric. Somebody say amen. amen. Are you with me? So what happened with the Jews? What happened to Israel at this time? Well, if you know your American history, in 1492, Columbus sailed the blue. Come on, some of you learned that song somewhere down the road. Well, why did Columbus sell the blue? Well, here's the reason why. Because in 1492, uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella began the Spanish Inquisition, which outlawed Jews living in their country. If you were Jewish and you were going to remain in Spain, you had to either, one, convert to Catholicism, two, you move out, and thirdly, be hanged. So those were your choices. So under, listen, under this severe persecution on the Jewish people, there was another Messianic Jew. His name was Christopher Columbus, who sailed the ocean blue and discovered the Americas. Since that time, hundreds of years, America has been a safe haven for the Jewish people all over the world. Are you with me? All right, so this is under four blood moons. The next one, Caleb. Now we move to 1949 through 1950. Once again, four blood moons, exactly on Passover, Tabernacles, Passover and Tabernacles once again. Well, what happened in this season? We know that in 1948 on May uh, 14th, that Israel became a nation state once again, against all odds, people said it would never happen. But after nearly 2,000 years, Israel did not exist. But under the uh, four blood moons, the nation of Israel was born in a day. Come on, somebody thank God. God brought his people together once again from the four corners of the earth to once again have a nation because that was a major prophetic sign going forward. And did you know, right after the, uh, they were uh, proclaimed Jewish uh, sovereignty as a nation, the very next day they were in war with six other nations. This started way back in Genesis. How many of you know the devil wants to eliminate the Jewish people? All right, we'll get into that a little bit later. Next slide, please, Caleb. 1967, 1968. Once again, you see four blood boons. 67, uh, April 24, Tabernacles, Passover, Tabernacles once again. Well, what significant uh, event happened at this time? Well, if you know your history, you're familiar with the Six-Day War in 1967 when uh, Egypt and all these other nations once again were coming against Israel. They were going to push them from the river to the sea. That was their goal. But little did they know, little did they know that Jewish, the Jewish nation would absolutely annihilate them within six days. Are you hearing me, somebody? We went through the statistics on there. It's phenomenal. There's no way historic, there's no way physically possible that the nation of Israel could have fought all these different countries. They were outmanned, outarmored. Out they didn't even have an air force at that time, the Israelis. But how many of you know our God is a big God? 
How many know that's where God likes to show up? He showed up. And as a matter of fact, West Point is our military academy. When the generals are asked there, do you study the, the Six-Day War in uh, for a tactical war warfare? They says, no, because we don't study miracles. Because they realized, they recognized that it was the hand of God that delivered the Israeli nation. As a matter of fact, go ahead, we have another slide here. On June 7th, is it? I need, I need to slide. There we go. June 7th. Wow, my memory served me well. June 7th, 1967, right after they captured the Temple Mount, after the Six-Day War, Chief Rabbi Major General um, Shalom, uh, Shalom Ogoren blew his shofar, and he said, the age of Messiah is upon us. Even the Jews are recognizing it's time for Messiah. Come on, is anybody in here waiting for Messiah? There's a whole lot of things that we don't have time to go into about the red heifers and all those things. But I'm telling you, church, we're moving down the track. We're not turning back. Jesus is coming. Next slide, please. The next set of tetrads was recently... 2014, 2015. You could see Passover, Tabernacles, but this time in the middle of it, on March 20th, there was a full uh, solar, a total solar eclipse on the religious new year on Nisan the 1st. On Nisan the 1st. And there were two more, Passover and Tabernacles again. Well, 2014, 2015, what transpired through that time frame? Well, in 2018, us as a U United States government, we recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Several administrations and presidents dating way back to the Bushes said, when I get elected president, Jerusalem will be the capital. Never happened. When I become president, Jerusalem will be the capital. Never happened. But how many of you know, listen, don't miss this, because this is not a political thing and I'm not talking about a person, because God sets up kings and he takes down kings. I don't know what your Bible says, but that's what my Bible says. All right? So, in 2018, exactly seven, uh, next slide please, exactly 70 years later, Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. And this is what the breaking news Israel reported. And this is uh, Adam uh, uh, Eliyahu Berkowitz. He said, he quotes Psalm 44. Watch this. And the same who says of Cyrus. Now let me pause there for a moment. Because if you know anything about Cyrus, he was a Gentile king. And he was wicked. Are you all with me? What does the next verse say? He is my shepherd. What? In other parts of the Bible, God calls Cyrus his anointed one. Do you know God can use anybody? Are you with me? He will fulfill, he's going to use the Antichrist. Are you hearing me, somebody? He's going to use the World Economic Forum. He's going to use the World Health Organization. He's going to use all these things because he is, our God is sovereign. All right. He is my shepherd. He shall fulfill all my purposes. He shall say of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, she shall be rebuilt. And to the temple, you shall be founded again. How many know there's another temple coming? Here's the article. In gratitude to the United States President Donald Trump for recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, the Nancet Sanhedrin and the Mikdash, meaning the temple, educational center are minting a replica of the silver half shekel biblically, biblically mandated to be donated by every Jewish male to the temple. Next slide, please. Here is a copy of what that coin looked like. Do you see the 70 years on there? Because it was act, uh, exactly 70 years from when they became a nation until they point, uh, put Jerusalem as the capital. And the Jewish people, the rabbis, recognized this as a prophetic fulfillment. Is somebody seeing this? 
Now the point here is it's all under the four blood moons. So that was the last one at 214, 215, and I don't remember because when we were doing the study, I went on the NASA websites and I studied. And they could tell you when the next blood moons are coming. It's not for another four or 500 years. So you just take that for whatever you want that to be. Amen? So that brings us to April 8th and the total solar eclipse. Remember that Bible prophecy, all of Bible prophecy is Israel-centric. Are you with me? It's not centered on America. I want to say that again. It's not centered on America. So please lay aside your national narcissism. God's word does not revolve around the USA. Amen. We, listen, we are not the apple of his eye. That would be Israel. Will other nations be involved? Absolutely. Absolutely will be involved in end times. So let's go to our next slide, Caleb. As you can see in the slide, there's a total solar eclipse in 217, then another one tomorrow, April 8th, 2024. Now the first, uh, first the, 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 the two eclipses, they're exactly seven years apart. Is this a sign? Well, well, this is not the first time that this type of eclipse has happened. This is not unusual. When they happen, they are always exactly seven years apart. Why? Because that's how God created the universe. That's how he created our system. Everything's in rotation. So that's not necessarily unusual. NASA tracks all of these. So some folk try to make a prophetic reading out of everything. Are you with me? Number two, they make an X. Did, um, yeah, uh, back uh, one time. No, no, that's okay. You're right, you're right. All right, you can see they make an X. It's not unusual. Here we can see that most solar eclipses make an X. Do you see all the X's on the national map? That's in America. And when they happen, they're 2,422 days apart. Now, there will be another X over America in 2045 and 2052. Exactly 2,422 days apart apart. It's only about 20 years from now, it will happen again. Next slide, please. From 2021 through 2028, there have been several X's created by solar eclipses all over the world. You can see them out in the Pacific Ocean, over America twice, uh, um, over America once, South America twice. You see them in Northern Africa, in Europe, even Australia has an X on it. Are you following me, somebody? So they're all these X's are created all over the world. Next slide. The eclipse in 2017 traveled over seven cities named Salem. For those of you who don't know, Salem means peace. It comes from Shalom, all right? So it's going to go over seven cities named Salem. However, how many of you know there's not only seven Salems in the U.S.? Next slide, please. Here's all the Salem's in the U.S. So I could go over a bunch of Salem's. Are, are, are you following me, somebody? So it's pretty easy to cover Salem's. In 2017, all the prophets were proclaiming seven years of peace because it's going over seven years of, or seven cities of, uh, of, of Salem. So for the next seven years, we have seven years of peace. How did that work out for y'all? Come on, does anybody remember 2020, the summer of love? How much peace did we have in America during that year? Are you, are you hearing me, somebody? So the next eclipse coming on tomorrow is going to go over cities called Nineveh. The prophets are proclaiming revival because there was revival in Nineveh. But there's other prophets proclaiming judgment. All right, so who's hearing from the Lord? Maybe nobody. Are you following me, somebody? I don't, I'm not trying to put pin in people's balloons here, but I'm just trying to reveal some truth according to the Word of God as to what's going on. Now, here's another one, and I just saw this the other day. 
these, where they make the X on the country. It's in a town called, believe it or not, Rapture. I actually looked it up. I, I actually looked it up, and it does. It, it goes over a city. I forget. It's, I think it's in Indiana. It goes over a city called Rapture. So the prophets are proclaiming tomorrow, you know what's happening. All right. The Rapture. Do you have your rapture clothes ready? Listen, listen. How many of you know the Bible is very clear that the rapture, if you study it out, is imminent? There are no signs. If there's a sign, then God's word is not true and God is a liar. Are you hearing me, somebody? My God. Number four. Next slide, please. All right. So there are three eclipses there showing. In these three eclipses, if you look at them close enough, you can see the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet called Aleph. The last letter in the Hebrew alphabet is Tav. In other words, the first and the last, the Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end. Well, what about all these other X's all over the world over the years? Was that a sign then when they were over Europe, when they were over Australia, seven years apart? Don't miss this statement here, church. Here's what the problem is is when we want something to happen or believe when something is going to happen, example, rapture, second coming, tribulation period, we then try to shoehorn, we try to eisegete current events that are not specific in the Bible. That's where eisegesis and exegesis are important when you study the Bible. Listen, these, I know these are theological terms, but it means we read the Bible and take out of the Bible. We don't look at current events and try to make them fit the Bible. Do you see the difference, somebody? A couple years ago, here's another example with Virgo. Everybody was there, was, well, not everybody, but there were some prophets out there saying that Virgo is a certain part of the sky, and it's going to be right on the Feast of Tabernacles, and it aligns with Revelation chapter 12, and people started uh, saying, the rapture's going to happen, there's signs in the heaven. I mean, it was a, a complete eisegesis of Revelation 12, because that's not what Revelation 12 is talking about all, uh, at all. So do not become hyper-focused on one sign, because there are many events that still need to occur before the second coming of Christ that are specific specifically laid out for the Bible, throughout the Bible. You're with me? Somebody say amen. amen. Now for the rapture, listen, now for the rapture, you best be ready today. Listen, even if the rapture doesn't happen today, your last breath might happen today. Ha. There is no eclipse that has to happen, my friend, before your last breath. You better have your rapture clothes ready right now. Because if that trumpet should sound, bang, we are out of here. There's not a second flight out. Is somebody hearing me? You better have your heavenly passport ready to go. Now, let me just make one more comment, and then we're going to get into the state of Israel. Because to keep prosper, uh, proper eschatology in Matthew 24, which a lot of people like to quote these verses, when Jesus is speaking about signs in the heavens, he's speaking about the tribulation period. He's speaking about that period of time. Are you following me? Now, it's my prayer to escape. I don't want to see those signs in the heavens. Watch. Matthew 24, uh, verses 29 through 30. Caleb, if you throw that up there. It says, immediately after the distress in those days, after the distress in those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall, fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds 
of heaven with power and growth. Uh, great glory. This passage is speaking about the great distress, which is the abomination that causes desolation. This is the time spoken of about halfway through the tribulation period. Now, I believe we will see the sun darkened. I was, I believe we're going to see stars going, falling, but we're not going to be on this side of it. Are you all with me? We're going to be above watching it happen. Come on, somebody. So, Let's move to the state of Israel. Since October 7th, there has been a global spiritual shift with the brutal attack by Hamas on Israeli civilians that was nothing short of barbaric. On Sunday, October 8th, that morning I addressed the issue here and I stated that even though America came out and supported Israel, For the most part, it wouldn't be long until we turned away. Now, I didn't say that as a prophet. I don't proclaim to be a prophet. I just said that because I read and I study the Word of God. Are you with me? In a matter of weeks, the protest began not only here in the United States, but around the world from Australia to Africa, from Europe to America. The hatred of of Israel was bubbling underneath the surface all along. It just took an event to trigger the manifestation. Now it's full-blown even in our own government. Is somebody hearing me? Here's a question. How does Israel, who is brutally and viciously attacked by a bunch of uh, barbarians, then because of the retaliation, now they become the bad guy. They become the oppressor. Please somebody explain to me how that happens. The protest, the slogan is, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. That's what they proclaim. So let's understand what they're asking for in their protest. From the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, is a mandate for the genocide of the Jewish people. They want to annihilate the Jewish people. So what river are they talking about? They're talking about the Jordan River. What sea are they talking about? It's the Mediterranean Sea. That, my friend, if you don't know your geography, is the entire nation of Israel. They want to wipe them out. Hamas is very, very clear in their charter because it states it right there in writing and they make it public and it's non-negotiable. They are not looking for any kind of a negotiation. Listen, my friends, don't be deceived. Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, Iran and others don't want peace. They don't want land. They want the extermination of the Jews, and they proudly and publicly state it, and they are uh, unequivocal. So why don't any of these politicians simply take them at their word and believe them? It's crazy. If I say I'm going to kill you, guess what? You should believe that I'm going to kill you. But none of them want to believe it. In 2005... Then President George W. Bush made a land for peace agreement in the Middle East. Listen, big mistake. Right after he signed the agreement for Israel to give their land away, Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. How many of you are familiar remember Hurricane Katrina? We suffered almost 2,000 deaths in America, and it cost 125 upwards of 125 billion dollars record-setting event in our country listen the message here don't give God's land away ever since 2005 since that agreement was signed when Gaza was turned over to the Palestinians after they were given their land for peace they have been firing thousands of rockets into Israel from that land that Israel gave them. They don't want land, church. They don't want peace. They want to annihilate the Jews. Now let me tell you the reason why. Because it's a spiritual war. Satan himself is behind this. 
Because if he can annihilate the Jews, he makes God out to be a liar. Because the word of God states that it is Jehovah who watches over Israel. And he never slumbers. He never sleeps. Uh, why so much about Israel? Because the word of God says as long as the sun, the moon, and the stars are in the sky, Israel would never cease to exist. Why so much about Israel? Because if God does doesn't save Israel as his word proclaims that would make him out to be a liar and if he is a liar our salvation is useless did somebody hear that so in the supernatural as well as in the natural Israel is fighting for their very existence so to their credit they are not letting up and before you begin to cry out about innocent civilians getting killed, and it's true, they are, unfortunately. There's no doubt. That's an unfortunate consequence of war. How many of you know war is ugly? There's never a pretty war. It's always ugly. However, there's no military on earth that even comes close to Israel in warning their enemy about military attacks. They send leaflets and airdrops. They send text messages, they send WhatsApps, they send emails letting the Palestinians know, listen, we're coming to this village because we're taking out this building on this date and time. Get out of Dodge. They let them know. So the opposition knows. But the truth is, in recent polling, listen, 82% of the Palestinians that live in Gaza supported the attack on Israel on October 7th. So this talking point that most Palestinians in Gaza, in Gaza are peaceful, it's a lie. They want to annihilate Israel. Does God love them? Absolutely, he does. He gave his one and only begotten son for the Palestinians as well. Are you with me? Should we love them? Absolutely. Because we should pray for their salvation that they would come to know. And we thank God that many of them are getting saved through visions because Jesus is showing up to them. Somebody thank God. Listen, Gaza has been given billions of dollars over the years to help them build infrastructure, schools, hospitals, roads, airports, etc. However, they spent the vast majority of this money to build its hundreds of miles of elaborate military tunnels in which to attack Israel. More and more nations are turning. South Africa recently filed a criminal complaint in the world court against Israel for apartheid. If anybody should understand apartheid, it should be Mzanzi. It should be South Africa. Are you with me? Now, in the case of South Africa, if you could prep that video, Caleb, it's going to come here in a minute. In the case of South Africa, during their apartheid, they had an all-white government while the majority of the population was black. That is apartheid. Are you following me? The majority had no voice in the parliament. However, Israel's parliament is not ruled even by all Israelis. There are people there from different faiths, different nationalities in there as well. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. So here's my question to the South African government. Why don't you file some criminal complaints against Turkey? How about Iran? How about Afghanistan? How about Gaza? They don't have any Israelis on their government. Furthermore, listen, did you know that the United Nations has filed more sanctions against Israel than all other countries combined? They don't file them against North Korea. They don't file them against Iran or China or Russia, anybody else, but it's Israel. This is spiritual warfare, saints of God. But listen, I thank God there is a true church in South Africa. They're standing up. They're letting their voices be heard. Roll the video, Caleb. As South Africans, we are here to deliver a message of hope.
to the people of Israel and also to make it very clear that uh, our government does not speak for us. Our, our government has chosen a side of terrorists, of cold, evil people. After seeing the houses that are burnt here, after seeing children that were taken hostage, I don't understand how can we side and even go as far as the ICJ to defend such atrocities. Please do not ever assume that our government or the political party in government speaks for the majority of South Africans. This has nothing to do with the history of South Africa. This has nothing to do with freedom fighting. This is evil. Let's call it that. Evil. So, people of Israel, as South Africans, we are here to tell you that we are not ANC. Our people stand in solidarity with you against hate. They stand in solidarity with you against terrorism. Bring them back home now. Come on, somebody put your hands together for the church in South Africa. We thank God that there are still those that are standing for truth. Our U.S. government is now calling for Israel to have a special election. I don't know if you followed this the last couple weeks on the news. The Senator Chuck Schumer wants to oust Benjamin Netanyahu was democratically elected, are you hearing me, in Israel. Why? Because he's not letting up until Hamas is completely destroyed. Senator Schumer recently verbally, publicly called for the Israelis to have a special election to oust him. Listen, saints of God, this is criminal according to the laws of the world court. Are you hearing me, somebody? For one nation to interfere with another sovereign nation's election, it's absolutely criminal. Roll the next video. On the Israeli side, the U.S. government should demand that Israel conduct itself with a future two-state solution in mind. We should not be forced into a position of unequivocally supporting the actions of an Israeli government that include bigots who reject the idea of a Palestinian state. Israel is a democracy. Five months into this conflict, it is clear that Israelis need to take stock of the situation and ask, must we change course? At this critical juncture, I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel. Of course, the United States cannot dictate the outcome of an, of an election, nor should we try. That is for the Israeli public to decide, a public that I believe understands better than anybody that Israel cannot hope to succeed as a pariah opposed by the rest of the world. As a democracy, Israel has the right to choose its own leaders, and we should let the chips fall where they may. But the important thing is that Israelis are given a choice. There needs to be a fresh debate about the future of Israel after October 7th. In my opinion, that is best accomplished by holding an election. He, he, he calls them, because they want to eliminate Hamas, he calls them bigots. Bigots. This is the highest ranking senator in our nation. Are you hearing me, somebody? The tide is turning all over the world. He says we don't have anything to do with other... Oh, yes. The CIA has done a lot. It's been revealed in turning over elections in other countries. But because he and his comrades don't agree with Benjamin Netanyahu, how they are exercising this war, he wants them ousted. It's not your nation. 
It's God's nation. Need to step out. Come on, are you with me, somebody? So listen, while it's very troubling to watch the world turn on this tiny little nation, and as an American, it's extremely disturbing to see our very own country turn, we know that this must happen according to the word of God prior to his coming and establishing his kingdom. Are you following me? I'm almost done. Here's a timeline overview of the events preceding the tribulation period and the second coming of Jesus Christ according to the word of God. Always remember this, church, before the second coming of Jesus Christ will be the coming of the Antichrist. Make sure you always keep that straight. Here are some prophecies that are still to be fulfilled and may be filled soon. But remember, Jesus says, watch and pray. Watch and pray. Number one, the destruction of Damascus is found in Isaiah 17. Damascus, Syria is the oldest continuously inhabited city on the face of the earth. The Bible says in the last days it will be brought to ruin. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, Israel just attacked uh, a, a building in, I, or, uh, in Syria, in, in Damascus, and they took out a, a couple head Iranians. Uh, military guys, Iran, just yesterday or the day before, said within 48 hours they're going to retaliate. It might even be happening right now as we're in service. It's, it's, we're, we're looking at day-by-day -day progress here. Are you with me? So this, this thing is bubbling. Number two. Uh, is the War of Gog of Magog, which uh, includes Iran, Turkey, Russia, Libya, Sudan. They're, they're going to attack Israel only to be thwarted by God himself. You could read that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. These still have to be fulfilled. Number three is the War of Psalm 83, which I believe, I believe, there's different thoughts here, but I believe that we could be witnessing the beginning of this Arab-Israeli war right now. We could very well be in the early stages of Psalm 83, which we're going to read here in just a second. Now, those three events that I just told you about, Damascus, Gog of Magog, Psalm 83, no one exactly is sure how these sequence of events will be fulfilled, how they'll take place. But we certainly see the world unifying today against Israel. We certainly see concerning Israel the wars and there's rumors of wars. But the good news is, listen, church, things aren't falling apart. They're falling into place. Amen? Amen? Let me close with just three scriptures. Psalm 83, it says in verse 1, O God, huh, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their head. With cunning they uh, conspire against your people. They plot against those uh, who you cherish. Come, they say. Here it is. Look, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. This is written 3,000 years ago, church. Verse 5, with one mind they plot together. They form an alliance against you. Jump to Joel, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather, I will gather, God is going to gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial, oh my God, for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and they divided up my land. Come on, is somebody hearing this? One more, Zechariah 12 and 5. Stand me, with me so I can close. That'll give me a good sign that we're done here. Zechariah 12, verses 1 and 5 it says, The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the human spirit within a person, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends the surrounding people reeling. That means they're going to send them, and they're going to be drunken with hatred. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. But on that day, somebody say, that day. 
when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her i will make jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations all those who try to move it will injure themselves on that day come on somebody shout that day I will strike every horse with panic and its riders with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty is their God and his name is Yeshua HaMashiach. Come on, somebody in the house of Judah, give our God a praise. Thank you, Lord. Victory's on the horizon. But just as Jesus said, we're going to go through some birth pains before the child comes. So don't get discouraged. Once again, I'm not trying to scare you, but to prepare you. Watch and pray. Know that these things are happening. But I'm telling you, somebody, that our God reigns. So in summary, tomorrow's eclipse. Personally, I don't think it's anything majorly significant. Will the rapture happen tomorrow? I doubt it. Because too many people are looking for it. Because I could always tell you the day that the rapture is going to happen. So on the day you least expect. But if it does, I'm all right with it. I'm ready to go. Is there anybody in the house that's ready to go? Even if I don't make it until tomorrow, even if I don't make it to the next hour, come on somebody, I am ready to go. But I can say this with the certainty of scripture and as a watchman on the wall, as a spiritual meteorologist, if you will, the storm clouds are gathering. The storm is on the radar. Raindrops are beginning to fall. Are you with me, somebody? Now listen, listen, the storm could pass. How many of you seen a storm coming? You thought it was going to be a downpour, but then it moved away. In sun, come on, anybody ever experienced that before in the natural? I'm telling somebody, listen, this storm that's happening right now could pass. We might get a little reprieve like we spoke about with King Josiah. We might get a little reprieve. But to be sure, if you're watching by this broadcast, God's wrath is coming to the earth. God's judgment is coming to the earth. And it will happen just as we read in his holy word and in his perfect timing. So for now, Judah, let's watch, let's pray, let's be ready, let's continue to keep our mandate. Let's go into Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outer post of the earth, outermost parts of the earth, and continue to proclaim Jesus Christ. Come on, if you're with me, come on and give him a praise in this house. To every nation, to every generation, to all creation, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ.